So today we're going to be talking about quality assurance and calibration of ABG and analyzers. So it's going to be Sam and me, Jill, can be presenting on us today. Okay, so the first, uh, first we're going to talk about the three things that we can actually measure in an ABG. Um, so an ABG machine has three electrodes, also known as three sensors, and that's the uh, PCO2, uh, PAO2, and the pH sensors. Those three are the only ones that are directly measured from a sample of blood. The other values that we get are uh, calculated based on the uh, other numbers that we calculate. So the first one is the pH that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the pH electrode is uh, a glass-like structure, um, so it's a three-dimensional latticework of central uh, silicon atom, and it has four oxygen atoms. So when the metals oxidize um, into the glass membrane, and it sees how much of the oxygen has gone through, and that's how the sensor is able to calculate um, the, what the pH of the, the sample is. Um, the, uh, another name for the pH electrode is the Sand electrode, which is named after the scientist that uh, came up with the uh, sensor. <clears throat> the other one that I'm going to talk about is the PaO2 electrode. So the, P, uh, the PaO2 electrode is an oxygen electrode, um, and it's a polygraphic um, cell. Um, the platinum rod inside is covered with an oxygen permeable membrane known as polyethylene, uh, and on the other side is where the unknown sample uh, is set. And based on how much of it goes across the membrane, that's how we calculate the uh, con oxygen concentration of the sample. Um, so the current passing through the cell is directly proportional to the oxygen uh, of uh, tension outside the membrane. So it directly um, measures the oxygen amount. And another name for this one is also the Clark electrode. Um, it's like the last one named after the scientist that came up with the sensor. And the third one that I'm going to talk about is the PaCO2 electrode, which is the carbon dioxide sensor. Um, the carbon dioxide sensor uses a CO2 permeable membrane uh, known as Teflon to allow carbon dioxide to diffuse through. So then, um, as you can see in the picture, the sample passes through the um, uh, aqueous, the liquidy layer uh, that's on the Teflon, and the sensor then measures how much of the CO2 is able to get through uh, the membrane. And this is known as the Severin Gauss electrode, named after scientists that came up with the design. Okay. So next we're going to go ahead and talk about the importance of calibration. <clears throat> so as we know, ABGs are an essential part of respiratory our respiratory work in identifying our patient's metabolic and respiratory status. So in order to have accurate representation of those values, we need to make sure that our machines are properly calibrated. So it's important to calibrate at least once a day to verify the validity of the machine according to the manufacturer's specifications. And generally, most ABG machines will do this on their own daily. Um, and if we look at the CILIA standards, which are specific, specific standards, of quality assurance, they are telling us that our ABG analyzers actually have to be calibrated every eight hours. So according to Celia, every eight hours, but in general, we need to make sure our machines are calibrated at least once a day, and they generally do this by themselves. Calibration involves adjusting the analyzer to ensure that responses are accurate and linear. And if we think about this, we are getting essential information about our patients' um, measurements as such as pH, carbon dioxide, and PaO2, as well as like electrolytes lactate and hemoglobin. So we really just want to ensure that the measure values response is are equal to our known values. So pretty much we just want to make sure that what we're getting is accurate and representative of a heart patient is actually doing. So next we have a, a TMC question that comes from our TMC that we took last week. And it says, according to Celia uh, standards, quality control must be performed for blood gas analyzers every uh, blank and the answer is every eight hours. Um, 
So Celia wants uh, ABG machines to be calibrated every eight hours to make sure that they're uh, accurate. Next, we're going to go into how to calibrate an ABG analyzer. So calibration is actually specific to each different manufacturer and brand, and so they'll have specific instructions. But in general, they work along the same uh, kind of values. So when we're calibrating the analyzer, again, we're doing it to make sure that it's functioning correctly. And how this works is that we insert a, a gas, a gas or a solution, known values. So these values will be one will be high and one will be low. The machine then reads um, and calibrates these known values. So we can have some issues with this as far as like gas levels or insufficient buffer solutions that would affect calibration. And what we're really looking for here is that our calibrations are within two standard deviations. So when we calibrate them, we want to make sure that our control mean is determined properly and that we are within the measurements that are allowed for our machine to be working properly. If you think of it in a different terms, you can relate it to kind of like your car's alignment. When you get into your car, you want to make sure it's driving straight as it should. If it veers to the left or the right, you know something's wrong. So if you take this for, you take it for an alignment. In the same way, we want to make sure that our analyzer is driving straight as it should. And if not, then we need to calibrate or realign to get that correct measurement. So essentially, we just want to make sure that our machines are working how they should. When we do go into calibration, we are looking at certain terminology that are specific for ABG analyzers. One of the first terms that we're going to talk about is control. So there's two types of controls. There's in control and out of control. When you look at in control, this is what we want. We want to be in our machine to be in control. We want measurements that are consistently falling within two standard deviations of our mean. So staying within the lanes as it should. We can have out of control which is a frequent random error that indicates a lack of precision and de demonstrates poor repeatability. So this is important because if we see an out of control step, then we need to take corrective action to make sure that our analyzer is back in control. Again, we're realigning it, making it sure that it is where it's supposed to be. We have different errors when we talk about ABG calibration. We have the first one, which is a random error. And this is just a single irregular value that falls within two standard deviations. So it's really just like, kind of like if you think about it, you're driving down the freeway and then you kind of fall asleep and you veer a little bit, but you correct yourself immediately. So that's going to be a random error. It's one little thing that goes out of the way, but we're getting right back into how we need to be. So that's fine. We look at it, we're like, that's not the best, but it's okay. The next one we're looking at is bias error. And this is um, over time, this is a trend that shifts above the mean and out of control values. So when we see these bias errors, we know this is a more serious um, effect and we need to do corrective action because there's something going on with our procedure or our instrument. So this will make a little bit more sense when we look at how we check these out, which is on the next slide. So really when we're looking at our controls and we're looking at our ABGs, like I said, there's these charts we can look at they are called quality control chart or also known as Leving Jenning Plus. So I put some pictures on here just to give you a visual of exactly what I'm talking about. When you look at the one on the right versus the one on the left, I know it looks confusing. You see a lot of dots and you're like, what the heck is this? How am I supposed to know? Well, I'm going to let you know. So the one on the left, we're able to look at it. And if you look at this green line here, this green line is like our mean. So this is a good. This is where we want it to be along. And as you can see these little dots here, they're within two standard deviations. So we can see the red line one and then two. Good, good, good. So these are all good. We see this is right. And then we have one that's about four off. So we're like, that's not good. But as you can see, it goes back into the level where it should be within the two standard deviations. So this is like how we talked about earlier. This would be a random error. So we see one random error and we're like, mm, okay, it kind of messed up, but it got back on track. And that's okay. No corrective action needed. If you look at the chart on the right, <clears throat> you can see a whole lot more going on. So we have these green dots. They're all within. Again, we have the speed line here, which is our target, right? This is where we want to be. We're checking our ABG analysis, and it's going up within, up and down within two standard deviations, these green dots here. But if you look over here on the right, you can see that these red dots here are falling further within two standard deviations. So this is actually over here is three standard deviations. This one's going up to four, going back down to three. So when we see this, 
we know that this is not right and we know that it's trending in a bad in a downward way so we know that this would need corrected action and we would need to get our quality control um, back to where we need it to be just to ensure that we're getting proper ratings from our ABGs and our patient's status. Okay. When we go into machines, there's a couple of things that we can do to troubleshoot. We oftentimes have errors and things that we need to kind of figure out. So in regards to troubleshooting, the first one we'll look at is an ABG machine. So sometimes some errors that can occur, this will be common issues, is electrode or sensor malfunctions, improper temperature control, or if it wasn't calibrated properly, uh, mechanical problems such as, you know, something in there is not working, it's jammed up, you need to fix it, or improper sample techniques. And then as far as sampling errors, there are a couple of things that we do need to look at. We, we need to make sure that we don't have any air bubbles in our samples. We need to make sure that our blood is not clotted and that we're not keeping our samples for a prolonged time. After 15 minutes, it's pretty much we need to take another sample. So those are some common things that we need to look at as far as troubleshooting in regards to our ABGs analysis and calibration. And then next, we're all, we also have another TMC question. Um, and this one says, the physician uh, put in an order for an ABG that was thought, stat. You were not busy, so you went ahead and collected the sample. What is the best way to avoid analysis errors associated with running the sample. And the answer choices are analyze the sample immediately, place the sample in ice slush, use dry instead of liquid heparin, uh, D, and cap the syringe to remove any air. And the correct answer for this one is B, and cap the syringe to remove any air. Because like we mentioned earlier, if you have air bubbles, uh, the blood gas will not run properly, and sometimes it might not even uh, run at all. So you want to make sure you remove every air. Thank you guys so much. We hope you learned something. And if you have any questions, feel free to message us. We'll help you out. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening.